So classical string theory. Here are some references. I mostly follow Polchinski. If you need motivations, you can uh, watch the video or you can check out this book. You won't learn string theory from watching a few videos. That's clear. These videos can be useful as a quick overview when you're studying, either by yourself or a class, or as a quick review after having taken a course to prepare for a more advanced course. Let's consider a point particle moving in space, so it forms a trajectory in space-time. It moves along, and we parameterize the position along this world line by tau. Clearly, if it was in flat space with no external forces, it would just go in a straight line, but here we imagine that there could be some external field, for example, a gravitational field, that makes it move a little funny. This could be described in the world line formalism, you may be not so familiar with, as an embedding. You have an embedding from the world line, tau, to space-time, and it's written by capital X to distinguish it from the pre-existing space-time coordinates, little x mu. So this is capital X mu, is the embedding function from the world line to space-time. The point particle action in the world line formalism is given by minus the mass of the particle times the integral of the space-time interval. This is, uh, should be fairly familiar to you, in that this interval is expressible as d tau times square root of this uh, contraction. Now you can exchange this tau here that differs from this tau by a Lorentz factor and you get this kind of uh, expression. This is the first exercise in Polchinski chapter 1. So you can expand this for small, small velocities and you recognize the usual kinetic term for a point particle minus the energy mc squared. Of course c we set to 1 if you're not familiar with these units, go back and review it in uh, Zwieback's book. It's very well explained there. What is really nice about this is if you vary this original action, that is very, very compact, in a curved background, you get the geodesic equation of general relativity. And this is nicely reviewed on this Wikipedia page, as a reminder. So this is a powerful way to talk about actions in uh, of a point particle moving in a possibly non-trivial background. What about a string? So if you had a string with two endpoints, an open string, it can move in space-time, and its ends describe uh, world lines. And together, they describe a world sheet. So now we have two variables, sigma and tau, and we have an embedding of the world sheet from sigma tau to space-time, much like the point particle embedding, but now it depends on two coordinates, sigma and tau. You might have wondered already in the point particle case, this is discussed in footnote 3 and 4 in Polchinski, chapter 1. The first is about the global issue. An immersion means that it doesn't double back on itself. And an immersion is differentiable, so this turns out to be not much of a problem. If you're interested in this, go and read this chapter. Uh, it is a very interesting topic. The formation of cusps on, for example, closed strings when a left moving and a right moving wave hit each other. You take these two coordinates, tau and sigma. A goes from 1 to 2, or 0 and 1 in this case. And uh, you form an induced metric. So you differentiate the embedding function x mu with respect to these two variables, giving you a 2 by 2 matrix, 2 by 2 metric on this world sheet. You should be familiar with the idea that the square root of the minus determinant of the metric integrated over a volume is the volume form. Here is an area because it's in two dimensions. We have a funny factor up front which is minus the tension and alpha prime here is known as the uh, slope for historical reasons but it has units of area. So this whole thing is dimensionless because we set h bar to 1 so we want the action to be dimensionless and then the tension should be units of 1 over length squared, which is energy by length, if you think about it. So this action has d-dimensional Poincaré symmetry, the usual Lorentz transformation plus a possible shift. It's obvious because the indices are contracted here. So right now we imagine that this moves in a flat background, but we will later generalize this to a curved background, as I was hinting at on the previous slide. So this is the two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry, that you can change coordinates on the world sheet. Tau and sigma could go to tau prime and sigma prime. This is an invariance of this action. This is manifest here because this is an area, and the area doesn't change under the relabeling of coordinates. Here's an open string. If you put it, for example, in a, imagine a point particle in a magnetic field, it will rotate in space. In space time, it will form a helix. String, it goes in a circle, it forms a it forms a shape called a helicoid, minimal surface. That means that given the boundary condition out here of the open string endpoint, you can compute that the minimal area given this boundary condition is this minimal surface. 
This kind of classical string theory is discussed at length in Zwieback's book. It is not much discussed in Polchinski, but it's a good thing to think about initially. And in fact, it does generalize to a lot of other interesting calculations in string theory. Well, the Plateau's laws tell you about minimal surfaces formed by soap, which is one of the original ideas of minimal area surfaces in mathematics. For example, Plateau observed empirically that the angle between these three vertices is 120 degrees and these four vertices is 109 degrees. There have been attempts to use this in physics many times. For example, imagine a, an electron as a spherical membrane that has electrostatic repulsion of itself, but it has tension, so it wants to pull itself together, and they can wobble and oscillate. Dirac actually considered this in 1962. There's a Wikipedia page on this if you're interested. He viewed the muon as the first excitation of this spherical membrane, so wobbling like this. That turned out to a mass 53 electron masses, which is not quite right, but it's a very interesting uh, model to study. In string theory, this has, this has reappeared as the Dirac Born Infeld action, which we'll talk about later. Another way to think minimal surfaces in, uh, in string theory is the Mellison Wilson loop. This has to do with the Wilson loop that you might remember from quantum field theory. If not, you can look it up. Imagine putting this in a gravitational field. So you have a surface that can be formed with this boundary condition but there's a gravity pulling it down, so the surface will look something like this. And depends, depending on the metric in this curved space, you will get different shapes. For a more interesting perimeter than this circle, you might get something like this. With a triangle, you get this minimal surface, where it's upside down, because it's hard to draw when it hangs down. And you can change the perimeter like this. And this is a nice paper about this here, if you're interested. And there's a trick. Polchinski discussed it also for the point particle. Here I will only discuss it for the string. Let's introduce a two-dimensional world sheet metric. We call it gamma. It's distinct from the induced metric little h that we had before, which is this object. This is a new object. It did not exist in the nambu goto action. And forming this is called a Polyakov action, even though Polyakov didn't really invent it, as discussed in Polchinski. To show their equivalent, you introduce these three new functions. This is a symmetric two by two matrix. You can compute the equation of motion for this metric gamma. It looks very much like the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action in general relativity to get Einstein's equation. You take the variation. This one is obvious. You vary the metric here. You get this thing. But you also need to vary the determinant. And you use something called Jacobi's formula from linear algebra. This is what you know from general relativity, how you vary a determinant. You multiply it out. And then you relabel indices CD to AB. So you can combine these two terms nicely into this combination. So you see that the equation of motion for gamma, this is a constraint on gamma. You introduce a redundancy of three functions, now you put three conditions. Doing that, you can actually solve this matrix equation. You observe it, this is kind of a trace. So taking the determinant of this matrix equation, you can solve for the trace and plug it back in, and you get this equation. You plug that back into the Polyakov action, and it reduces very quickly to the number goat action that we had to start with, because these two determinants cancel. And this is just a constant trace that gives you the right normalization we had before. So the Polyakov action will be the main object of study. It has d-dimensional Poincaré symmetry, just like Namagoto, under which x transforms and little gamma is invariant. It has two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry, meaning symmetry under change of coordinate on the world sheet, under which x is a scalar and gamma transforms as a two-tensor, as befits a metric on the world sheet. But now we have an additional funny symmetry called while invariance, under which x is invariant, but little gamma transforms with a rescaling. It's an overall rescaling, so it has no matrix structure, but it depends possibly on the coordinate sigma. So these are the symmetries of the Polyakov action. Sometimes diffeomorphism is shortened to diff. Now where did this two-dimensional while invariance come from? Different world sheet metrics give the same induced metric. That's the reason. So Namagoto had no gamma. If you change gamma, it doesn't notice. So this is entirely new symmetry that came from introducing this new world sheet metric. You have a symmetry, you want to use it. This usage is very closely related to what I said before. You vary the Polyakov action with respect to the metric. We already did that. But now you define the energy momentum tensor by dividing by this object here. And it's slightly non-standard normalization in field theory, but in strength this is conventional. Then you cancel this funny factor, and you have this nice object left. So this is the stress energy tensor derived from the Polyakov action. As we said before, we would like this to be zero if this is to be equivalent to the number goal action classically. So we want to impose TAB equals zero as a classical constraint. It's another way to express what I said before. Now this stress energy tensor has diffeomorphism invariance. 
meaning it's conserved. And in complex coordinates, that you, if you've seen this before, this will be very evident to you. If not, we'll talk about it later. There's a current, there's a neuter current that will lead to conformal symmetry of the quantum field theory on the string worksheet. While the variance can be translated to trace of the stress unit tensor is zero, which is easy to see here. If you trace this here, you see that and it vanishes classically, which in complex coordinates means that the off diagonal component z, z bar is zero. However, there could be a quantum anomaly. These are classical invariances. They could be an anomaly, and it turns out to be easy to preserve diffeomorphism and Poincaré invariance from classical string theory and the quantum string theory, but it's not as obvious to preserve the quantum while invariance. As a short uh, bonus question, is the Polkov action unique? No, we could add the worksheet Ricci scalar to it. However, this is uh, topological. It doesn't depend on metric, it doesn't contribute to the equations of motion, because it's in two dimensions, it's the Euler characteristic. Now, Euler didn't define the Euler characteristic like this. It follows from the gauss bonnet theorem that Euler's definition, which is more like this in topology, as we would call it today, is equivalent to this uh, geometrical definition. For example, a cube has Euler characteristic 2, because it has 8 vertices, 12 edges, and 6 faces. If you're interested in this, take a look at the definition of Euler characteristic and the gauss bonnet theorem. This leads to a whole slew of mathematics. For example, the Euler class is a natural generalization of this object uh, to vector bundles. And there's a lot of fun math here. The generalized gauss bonnet theorem, the Riemann-Roch theorem, and the Atiyah singer index theorem. Mathematics, the index of the Dirac operator is integral uh, integral churn class of the vector bundle times the A-roof genus of the curvature, but this is not necessary to understand in detail right now. The summary is, here's the Polakov action. It's given in terms of the embedding function from world sheet coordinates sigma and tau to space-time with an index mu. There's the world sheet object gamma that appears in this action. There's a normalization that has to do with this object with units of area. The Polakov action is classically equivalent to the number go to action, which is just the area of the world sheet. If we impose that the stress unit tensor vanishes. And this is simply because the stress unit tensor is defined as the variation with respect to the worksheet metric. And that was what we needed to impose to get back to the number goat action from the Polakov action. This action has symmetries Poincaré in d dimensions on this index. It has diff symmetry in two dimensions on these indices. And it has this, at this point, perhaps somewhat mysterious wild symmetry of rescaling of the worksheet metric.